Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. This is the first in our series of webinars with the CEOs of virtual banks. I'm Helene Lee. I'm the general manager of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. And I'm very pleased to have gathered with us today two of the CEOs of virtual banks, as well as our chairman, uh, you know, all on the same panel to share quite a few insights into this space, which is really very timely. And it also coincides with uh, the report on virtual banking seen in Hong Kong that uh, the FTHK, the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, have collaborated with Quinlan and Associates uh, to put together. So we're very pleased to actually have, uh, you know, hear it directly from the CEOs about, you know, what's now, what's next. So that's the reason why we call it straight talk with the CEOs. Uh, and uh, indeed, straight talk has been, you know, the kind of, um, uh, if you like, the kind of, you know, uh, whole, whole attitude in which we put out this report. Now, on that note, let me just introduce the panelists and speakers first. Um, you know, we've got uh, Roxen Chi, CEO of ZA. Hi, Roxen. So nice to have you here with us. And we've got Ryan Fong, CEO of Ping An One Connect Bank. Hello, Ryan. And hello, of course, hello. And of course, we have Benjamin Quinlan, chairman of FTAHK and CEO and managing partner of Quinlan and Associates. Hi, Ben. Hi, Elaine. So I'd like to just start by passing uh, you know, the, the podium to Ben to give us a few of the highlights of this really rich uh, report uh, that uh, we have put together uh, before we actually turn to invite uh, further thoughts from the CEOs and have a straight talk with them. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Helene, and nice to see everyone on the call today. We've got a pretty packed webinar. Um, as Helene mentioned, the I guess the idea, the original uh, catalyst for the VB report was it came about in Q3, Q4 last year. We were really thinking about um, the VB ecosystem. Eight new virtual banks have been approved and we're launching throughout 2020. Uh, it was obviously a time of major change due to COVID and a real drive in digital adoption. But what we started to realize is that beyond a couple of articles and posts, people didn't really have a very strong grasp of exactly what the Hong Kong banking landscape looked like and what the actual Hong Kong virtual banks were planning to do. So that was pushing forward the idea to well, why don't we create a, a research piece that covers the whole ecosystem and really breaks it down into its parts, puts some facts and data behind it and talks about the view going forward with the eight new virtual banks in Hong Kong. I think the key things that I want to run through today isn't giving, I guess, a synopsis of the whole report. It's just all the key takeaways that we really want to talk about for the purposes of the two VB CEOs that we have on today, PAOB and ZA Bank, uh, given that they're a little bit more focused on the SME segment in addition to the retail. And that is why we have clustered the conversation as such, because you can see with most of the eight virtual banks, they're focused on the retail market. And from that perspective, for those of you who have set up a virtual bank account, you can see that you, you, know, you take a selfie, a photo of your Hong Kong ID, really, really great stuff. And within two, three minutes, you've got your bank account set up quite a different experience to my time setting up my bank at HSBC in the past, I have to admit. But then there's this whole new layer of what about the SME market and why is that special? So I guess some of the key takeaways in the report. So how big is Hong Kong's virtual bank or how, how big is Hong Kong's banking market in and of itself? And that number we actually came to was around 375-ish billion Hong Kong dollars in 2020 for retail, corporate and commercial banking. So, you know, that excludes things like investment banking and so on, global markets. It really is the core bread and butter of the area that the virtual banks are gonna operate in. And what's surprising is to be honest, that market size is pretty large. It's just shy of 50 billion US dollars in revenue. And when you look at the actual Hong Kong bank landscape, the top four banks, uh, the top four incumbent banks, which is HSBC, Hang Seng, um, BOCHK, and what is the last one? Gosh, I should have remembered this. Uh, yeah, Standard Chartered, sorry. So those four players, when you look at the total share of deposits, they take up about 62% of that market and then loans and advances about 54%. So huge amount of dominance in that area. 
But did you know Hong Kong has 172 licensed banks that are operating in the city? So there's 168 other banking providers that capture the remaining 40%. And that's where there's this massive degree of fragmentation among who is providing what and servicing which clients. And the reality is we can all talk about the pain points that the incumbents have, but when you move down that value curve or the, the I would say the service curve to the different providers, many of these other 160 plus banks are pretty primitive when it comes to their digital proposition. And that creates an amazing opportunity for the BBs here. Now, when we were talking about the view going forward, I think a lot of people understand the pain points with retail, but also in the SME segment, when you look at the kind of statistics we were putting in the report, we were saying, I think there was one figure in figure six, if you refer to it, uh, if you download that paper, amount, uh, um, about the amount of SMEs uh, with respect to their credit applications that were either unsuccessful or only partially successful in securing a loan. And the numbers are quite telling. I would say over the past uh, three years, three or four years, you've seen probably half of the SMEs that have applied for a loan either been rejected or only partially approved for their credit applications. And as a result of that, many of them don't have the basic necessities for funding and many of them draw on their own reserves or other forms of finance to fund their business. That is a bit of a concern or a red flag to me as to where are they sourcing their funds and aren't there other providers out there that can think of a slightly different way of thinking along the lines of credit scoring or how to evaluate the risk profiles of these SMEs to actually extend them the banking services that they need. Now with the eight virtual banks here, uh, as we mentioned, ZA and PAOB both have the SME proposition as well as that AMP bank is also in the running. All the others are very much focused on the retail segment there. So Airstar, WeLab, Libby, Mox, and Fusion. And one of the very interesting points was around all the big backers of these various banks. As you know, many of the backers in that ecosystem are some of the largest Chinese tech and conglomerate players. Uh, the names that you can pull up are things like your Xiaomi's and your AMTDs, uh, BOCHK, Jardines, JD Digits, uh, PCCW. I mean, when you go across the ecosystem, it really opens up the idea of, wow, you are now starting to leverage or tap into parent company expertise in tech, telco providers, all these different people within the ecosystem. For PAOB, you have Ping An, which is that parent company, as well as OneConnect, which are their key shareholders. And for ZA, it's ZA International, right? And which is obviously covering many different aspects of the financial services ecosystem. Now, within this, we obviously talk about some of the challenges facing going forward. We, you know, the virtual banks, I would say, are not a new concept. And I think all the VB CEOs are very transparent. And when we went through the interviews around them, they're very much acknowledging the fact that there is something unique and fundamentally great to deliver to the Hong Kong market, but the path ahead is not just going to be you know, smooth sailing. Um, there are things that they need to overcome when it comes to ensuring customer data protection, that all their path to profitability is going to be carved out in the right way. Customer acquisition is obviously a really important part of the journey to be successful, but many of the VBs realize it is expensive. It's not necessarily the easiest thing. So coming up with unique ways to do it. And when we look at, you know, carving out that path to what is ultimately going to be a successful virtual bank, my view is a bank is not going to feel like a bank in a few years from now. It's just going to feel like a super app, something that you can log on that handles all of your lifestyle, banking, savings, investments, foreign currency needs. That's just integrated within what we call a potentially closed ecosystem. And you can see an amazing move by all of the players in this space to really find the partnerships within the ecosystem who add most va value to their end customers. And that's a really interesting part of the journey. The other area is, you know, Greater Bay. Is there a geographic opportunity to expand out? But all of this, when you wrap it in, it means what? The market size number that we came up with is a, is a five year revenue potential as we genuinely think the VBs among the eight could tackle about 19.3% of the total revenue pool by 2025. And that works out at about 76 billion Hong Kong dollars in revenue. Now, you know, I won't go into it in too much detail. There are questions about, well, can that sustain all eight? And our view is it's likely that there will be key players within this segment that will win 
uh, and that will win very strong. And that revenue number beyond the 2025 mark will continue to spur forward in a way that I think will show very clearly in PL, as well as the way that people talk about the virtual banks uh, going forward. And I guess on that basis or on that note, it really, you know, I bring it back to it's not about hearing about me, it's really about getting the view from Ryan and Roxon today as the CEOs of PAOB and ZA Bank to share their perspectives in particular on the SME segment. And this is an area of the market that I personally find fascinating and that I think everyone in this uh, webinar really wants to understand a bit more about. So I'll pass it back to Helene to then manage that introduction, but Ryan and Roxon very much looking forward to hearing your additional thoughts today. Hey, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for setting the scene so nicely. Uh, before we go in there, I just want to remind everybody, and there are quite a few uh, coming into the room already, uh, please raise your questions for the panelists or for Ben uh, via the Q&A uh, section uh, on the app. So, uh, you know, we will try to get to your questions as soon as possible. Uh, although we do have a discussion flow that we'd like to, you know, go through uh, and get the insights, uh, you know, the straight talk with the CEOs. Uh, thank you for setting that scene so nicely, Ben, because, you know, the VBs are really, you know, trying to extra bank and over bank market. You know, Hong Kong is so over bank and trying to extra bank them could be a tall order uh, to ask of anyone. So, you know, the SME focus, is that a sweet spot? Is, you know, what is the reason for PAOB and for ZA to focus, uh, you know, also on the SME uh, side, uh, you know, particularly the lending side, um, you know, is that because it's underserved? Is it because that's the way to to deal with it? Uh, you know, who wants to go first? Ryan, maybe? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Helene. And I think as you already point out, um, Ben has set the st stand very, very, very good. Well, um, I think since I took up this role, one of the common questions that I got asked is, Hong Kong sees we overbank. Why would Hong Kong MA still grant another eight virtual bank license? Would it be another me too or can virtual bank survive? Um, you also asked about, well, whether SME would be a Swiss box for the virtual bank. I think certainly my view would be a positive one. Otherwise, I won't be joining a virtual bank. But let me call you some fact, because um, I think since Asian financials, not Asian, this financial tsunami back to 2008, um, the Hong Kong government has set up some specific support on the SME space, which is the SME guarantee scheme, which is offered by trade industry department. And the guarantee percentage is up to 50%. The next year, in 2009, they further refined the campaign and uh, through Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation, they offer SME finance guarantee scheme. Back to 2009, the guarantee percentage was 70%. And progressively, this scheme constantly got refined from 70% up to 80 and then up to 90%. And the last year, because of um, the COVID, the government even over 100% of government subsidized program, 100% SME finance guarantee scheme. But from time to time, I'm sure everyone will hear from the, for example, LACO, um, the legislative council member always complain or raise concern about SME finding it difficult to open a bank account, SME finding it difficult to obtain credit support from bank. So people may ask, then why? I mean, if the government is happy to take up 90% of the credit risk or even 100%, technically, there shouldn't be any concern for banks to lend to SME. But based on my past experience, probably there's still some other element has not yet been taken care. Of. And that's why banks always find it difficult to open bank account or extend credit to the SMEs, in particular for the micro enterprises. Because there are two, another two cost factor that um, people generally overlook. Credit cost is one of the components, or perhaps one of the key components. But there are also other two key pain points. First of all, it's about the operating cost for banks to serve SMEs. Because it is quite common for banks to open an account, they lead um, a relationship manager to go meet the owner of the business, and then based on the financial statement or bank statement, they have to write a proposal as to why the bank should open an account, just in case if the bank want to extend credit. It's another round of complexity, which is um, 
the proposal will then need to route to credit department. The credit analyst will have to analyze the statement to make a credit decision. And of course, the bank will also need to run through compliance department or the anti of the FCC in this day called financial crime risk team to ensure that uh, all the AML anti-money laundering related risks are properly assessed because this is a big part of the whole process. So by just hearing from all these process, you can imagine that the cost is quite expensive. Uh, in my old day, when I was working in uh, one of the key player, as mentioned by Ben, um, the average cost to open an SME account and to maintain an SME account amounts to 800 to 1,000 US per annum. And that's the reason why for the micro or small enterprises, unless the owner can put in a very sizable or meaningful deposit or um, the loan size attain certain level. Otherwise, it won't be profitable for any banks to serve SMEs. And this also caused uh, the challenge for bank um, in the past one decade or two to serving this uh, particular segment. So that's one of the key pain points. Another key pain point is, in particular for the uh, startup, because they don't have much capital in the company. So whenever they have new business opportunity, the owner will always have to inject personal fund in the company in order to close the deal. And um, of course, after they make the money, the money can then send back to the personal account. But this sort of activity makes the banks very difficult to assess the fund flow. And this also creates additional complexity for the bank from credit risk angle or from FCC angle. And combination of these two, that's why somehow uh, the, the banks always find it difficult to serve this particular segment in the past one, two decades. And somehow there's uh, always risk and opportunity. The risk is some of the cost challenge, some of the efficiency challenge I just mentioned. Um, but to take it a positive side, it's also an opportunity because as Ben mentioned, Hong Kong has, appears to be in general, extremely, extremely overbanked. But still, if we, can, if we can resolve the pain point or challenges being faced by some of the marketplace in Hong Kong, i.e. we stand a very good chance to crack the market potential and enable us to serve the micro and SMEs. And that's why the, um, for, for Ping Almond Connect Bank, since we launched for business, our key focus is really how to serve SMEs and um, from uh, some of the communication that we have had in the past, you'll find that we try to resolve the pain point by leverage on data. Because for Ping Almond Connect Bank, we have partnered with a e-custom declaration service provider called Trailing. And for everyone information, for all the import export trade company, it is a requirement that they provide the import export transaction information to custom department in the electronic format for one of the free service provider within 14 days. And Trailing happened to be the biggest service provider with extremely dominant market share. And through this um, partnership, we're able to have access of some trade pattern information because for import exporter, I think it's a quite natural to say that, well, for any import exporter, the more transaction they, and they, they have had in the past, i.e. the more healthier of the underlying business. So this is part of the logic. And more than that, by leverage on the data or alternative data, we're able to address some of the limitation or constraint of the existing or traditional financial document. Because as you all know, for the um, financial statement, it's always a bit outdated because for the next financial statement, no matter how hard you try, it's talking about those information being conducted in the 16 or 18 months ago. Even you look at the bank statement, uh, in the case of trade, if we believe there's a credit turnover or debit turnover, i.e. any transaction that you can review from the bank statement already reflect the history that was happening three, four months ago. But for customer information or e-customer information, it was reflecting the information in the past 10 days or so. So this gives you a much more timely information for the banks to assess the healthiness of the SMEs. And secondly, people always concern about the financial, the quality of the financial statement or bank statement. Bank always worry about whether this is comprehensive enough or whether there will be any exaggeration. But by looking at the custom declaration, declaration information, it provides you a kind of like a validate source of information because um, the custom department will always validate those decay information versus those information they collect from the shipping company or freight forwarder. So they always do a kind of like a matching process to ensure that the information are true and correct. So it's validated. So you don't have to worry about the quality of the information that much 
as compared with the financial statement or bank statement. And thirdly, it gives you a, the most comprehensive view because for any import export transaction, it is a low legal requirement to report to custom department, i.e. it gives you a comprehensive overview about how the SMG was performing. This comprehensiveness of information, not just limited to the entity itself, but also give you a comprehensive view across other places in the same industry. Because I'm sure that in the COFIC, the import export that involve in the luxurious item will have a much different performance compared with those who involve, which involve in the daily accessory. So these are the beauty that we see. And that's why we, when we talk with trailing, we are able to leverage on this uniqueness of information. We are able to build a risk model that enables us to provide a different set of experience to our customer. Right. And this also enables us to, um, to, to serve them in a different way. But um, perhaps I talk too much. But the, somehow this is kind of like um, um, why we think SME is kind of like a sweet box because it has been underserved for a long time. And we are able to find a partner that um, enables us to effectively right that's great thank you so much ryan i mean for for kicking it off now from a, a sort of pure play uh you know sme bank maybe roxanne you know you are you are a, a bit of a hybrid i would say you know there's also sme there's also retail uh, and a great you know experience in terms of onboarding onto ca so would you like to share from your perspectives is sme lending a sweet spot and if so how thanks I um, agree with Ryan, uh, definitely a sweet spot, but also I think there's one thing that we have to add to the report after Ryan's um, um, note on, on Benjamin. We, we need to add a pain point from bank's point of view. Um, the SME overhead does serve as one of the reasons why we have eight pain points from customer portfolio and SME. Read Benjamin's report. I think that's our figure four, if I'm not wrong. And I think the sweet spot is also one of our policy objectives, uh, being financial inclusion and promoting fintech and innovation. I think from a, from a market point of view, I think the SMEs employ 1.2 million people in Hong Kong. That's around like 45% of total employment. And I think, I think Ryan nailed it to the point whereby trading company makes up bulk of the SME in Hong Kong in terms of number of enterprises or in terms of number of um, people engaged in SMEs. I think 30% of the 1.2 million are actually in the import export trade and wholesale business. So I think that's one good segment. And I think one differential is uh, when I launched um, commercial banking on the 22nd of March, uh, we're focusing also on the rest of the SMEs because if you look at the trade um, uh, department data, I think the other 70% is across 10 different industries. And we don't really have a specific industry focus per se, just like our retail banking, right? You have Hong Kong ID, you have a mobile phone, come join me. Um, same thing for SME, if you want good, quick, um, banking services come to us, virtual bank. So that's, that's one of the area that we're looking into whereby we want to make sure that SME is a profitable account or relationship uh, uh, management rather than rather a pain point from a bank to engage them, simply just want to promote financial inclusion. But then one thing just to share with the audience here, you know, retail banking and, and corporate banking is two completely different animals. So, so you might be opening an account like Ben said, right? Two to three minutes through our app. And um, the same should not be expected because opening an SME have to go through a lot of analysis as well as if you think of a, a, a corporation, right? You're opening a, an account for a corporation. You have to study the industry and each of the founders slash directors is actually an individual account. So and I, I, I want to make sure that people don't mix it up because we have such a great success in promoting retail banking. Um, the same should be expected. Yes, the same should be expected whereby we introduce FinTech and also uh, the lesson learned from retail banking. But then I think, I think both the industry, the regulators and also us as virtual bank operators have to make a change from the point of process revamping more than just technology because the whole process is still technology is an enabler. Uh, we are the one who changing the whole um, onboarding process plus the approval. I think the one point that, that Ben mentioned in terms of approval rate, I think that rate is still undermined and is super pain point because the moment you pass something to seek approval, there's already 
the second phase. The first phase is whether you are going to write an approval. So the rejection rate is definitely much higher than, than that 60% approval rate in the uh, government data. And I think one point I just want to bring out to share with everybody is uh, the regulators are helping out. Um, if you look at the uh, MA's um, latest initiatives on the CDI, I think there's a commercial data interchange that would help us, virtual bank plus traditional banks in terms of um, credit monitoring. Because one of the key pain points as noted in Ben's report is on the credit costs. And if we can have better ways to protect the bank and maintaining asset quality, I think both asset quality will be improving plus the costs of lending would be improving too because I mean, it's, it's, it's a direct correlation. So CDI is one thing that we see the government is, is pushing through and hopefully that will come out smoothly because, because I think the data that we're looking at is not contributing from us. It's not like TransUnion, right? It's actually data contributing from various government um, um, sources. So that definitely would help um, the whole financial service to have a better or a more healthier um, um, position for, for the banking industry. Well, I'll pass it back to Henning. Thank you. Thank you, Roxon. I think uh, there are so many you know, diverse perspectives um, to this. Um, I don't know whether Ben has anything to add to this, but I think you both actually, you know, converge onto the point about how do you actually de-risk or how do you manage, you know, the risk involved in SME lending uh, with, you know, the market outreach. And I know there are quite a few, you know, valuable points uh, that Ben was mentioning uh, in the in the report as well. Perhaps I will throw this back to Ben first before coming back to the two CEOs about balancing, you know, the risk or de-risking it while you actually, you know, go into the market outreach. Ben. Sure. I, one of the most uh, most important points that resonates with me is around uh, when Ryan was talking about the risk engine, and the reality is, you know, from a traditional credit scoring process at a brick and mortar incumbent bank. It's really old school. And you've seen so much uh, development in this space, particularly in B2C, that's where it all started uh, with buy now, pay later apps and, and so on. And looking at all these alternative credit scoring metrics to assess what is the trustworthiness and credit worthiness of an individual. Many of these data parameters, they get a bit more complex when you look at the SME space. But the idea behind it is very much the same. And can you be looking at things beyond your traditional income statements and all the other metrics that you would otherwise see to evaluate whether this is a company you want to lend money to? Ultimately, you know, lending is a gateway to cross-selling and upselling other services. If you do provide that access to funding for an SME and you do it, and I don't think the VBs are going to move down the path of getting so risky and driving higher MPLs. People have asked me this and I've said absolutely not. I think it's quite the opposite, to be honest, because the visibility over data is so much more powerful than a traditional bank and if it's utilized in the right way uh, the VBs are going to mop this up and that's the area that I think is really quite attractive and I'm curious to understand because risk engines often end up or they're often considered a bit of a black box so people work out well what what actually goes into it or what are the parameters that are looked at that's the secret source right but overall if you're getting to a point where you are uh, you know, funding firms that otherwise do not receive access to these traditional services, you have really got that relationship very well anchored. And I do think the VBs are in a very prime position. And I'm interested to see how that lending cycle evolves to then the upsell of all the other services that many of these uh, SMEs need. So really, really exciting. And that those points resonate with me. Thank you. Well, I'm with you. Sorry, I just want to say I'm with you 200%. Um, because there's one point I want to echo as well, which is um, you talk about asset quality. And I think based on the past few months of experience, that's exactly our observation. Because um, people normally think those segment or those clients, which traditionally not being served by the bank, must be of high credit risk. But somehow, I think the problem that we try to resolve are uh, those relatively small in scale enterprises that might not from the traditional process that justify or, or, or appears to be profitable, but they're of good credit quality. And um, some of the things that we also share in the market in the past is um, POB launched for 
entered into a test property launch back to June last year. And uh, we have been extending credit facility to SME for the past nine months or so. And so far, we don't even record one delinquent account, not even one. Uh, that was the case that uh, with two days of past due because the owner do not know how to operate um, the fund transfer through faster payment system. But other than this, we don't even record any overdue because of credit concern. So that's also a, another proof that, um, well, they don't get, um, or they are not easy to pass the requirement of some of the traditional payers in the past, doesn't mean they're of worse credit quality. Absolutely. And actually on that note, I would like to, you know, uh, ask Roxanne maybe to chime in on, you know, how do you actually, because, you know, apart from trading, uh, there are so many different sectors where the SME comes from. So how do you actually balance that risk when you go about, you know, broadening your market base and outreaching? Sure. Well, we don't balance that risk. We just manage it. Um, I think credit is very traditional. You can't really black box it. So the key um, mitigation factor for, for me, at least get the right team, both first line and second line have to be engaged in having a high risk awareness and also embracing technology to make the process more efficient because I mean, turnaround time is one key element that we control at ZA Bank and that applies to both retail and commercial. And other than that, just uh, a continuous risk monitoring because approval is just the first step and engaging an SME relationship is a lifelong um, uh, process. I mean, because companies don't die until uh, unless they default. Because so so that's one key thing that we are bringing in from the traditional bank to virtual banks, in terms of the, the whole traditional credit underwriting standard. I mean, we're not cutting any corners in terms of approving, nor are we cutting any corners in terms of credit monitoring. But I think in a way we're leveraging on data and resources that are not readily available traditionally to apply to the virtual banking and arena. So that's exactly what Ryan is also doing. So that's where we are. I think get the right people, get the right system. So we'll have a much better asset quality comparing to the rest of the world. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything to add to that, Ryan? Because I know you're very focused on um, trading, you know, the trading mm -hmm. sector in particular, um, please. Okay, well, the, I think as you already point out, um, our key focus at this stage is, is on the trade. Um, Roxanne also mentioned it because uh, for trade SME, it accounts for about one third of um, the SMEs in Hong Kong. And this is the biggest category. And that's why this will be identified as the first use case. Um, given that we have a particular use case, um, that's why we can leverage on data because um, for trade information, because I think post account monitoring, um, there are a few aspects. Of course, credit aspect is one part, but AML are equally important. So from credit aspect, I believe it's simple. First of all, we have a scorecard being developed, a risk assessment, risk assessment platform being developed. But more important is after we extend credit or after we open the account, whether the customer continues to behave or operate as if the pre-account setup stage, that's critical. Because uh, if we notice that uh, there's a substantial increase or a substantial decrease in, in the turnover, either way may not be healthy. So, but now with a specific partnership, we're able to monitor the account performance. How do they perform compared with the peers? How do they perform month for month for why? We can have all these things being done automatically and at the fingertips. And that's really help us to improve the cost to serve SMEs as well. And one step further, on the AML perspective, because as soon as we have the customer consent, we're able to obtain or assess the e-customer information, i.e. we're able to review whether the SMEs will trade with any sanctioned country or any, any sanctioned party. And this is a critical part because conventional processes mainly relied on the RM to talk to the owner or to spot any suspicious transaction through bank statement. But now with the data, we're able to spot it at the source. And there's also some cases that we share with the mass media in the past. Um, we encounter few cases that the owner intend to hide their transaction with the central parties. And we're able to spot it out in seconds. And this is critical to protect the banking system in Hong Kong as an international financial service center. So these are the things that we believe that with data, 
cost is uh, one of the key advantage, but more important is about the accuracy to monitor and account. It, is, it doesn't mean anything negative. It's more important is, for example, if we notice that the customer will need help, instead of we do nothing and wait for the customer to knock the door and ask for help, we can proactively offer some assistance or support to the SMEs. So these are things that uh, we believe that we can try to serve SME in a much different way compared with the traditional one. Of course, next things or most important is trade is just the first part because there's only a handful of uh, one third. Of course, there are some SMEs as mentioned in the trade industry department or census department that we believe they're already well served by the banks. But there are also some that uh, we're in the process to develop another model so that we can offer a similar kind or similar set of experience as if the trade SMEs. So um, just stay tuned, we're working hard on it and hope, well, because the, this is the most important. We believe that if we want to bring a different set of experience, um, technology is just one part, but probably the, one of the key components around this is really about um, what sort of data that we can leverage. And that's why I, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Roxanne just mentioned about the CDI platform being led by the Hong Kong MA. Because if we want to serve SME, if we want to improve the banking service in general, um, the most important is really about the, how to get different form of data being available so that different player or participant can see through the performance of the SME through different dimension. And in order to come up with a product or service that really gear to those micro SMEs in Hong Kong. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Now, um, you know, we've got a few questions coming in from the audience, uh, which mm -hmm. I would like to just sort of raise, um, you know, with, uh, with, with all of you as well um, here. And I think- um, right. Sorry, this, Helene, May, maybe I'll just okay. add one, one more point around what I would call the underserved segment. So my background as I came from investment banking, and I spent a lot of time after well, I started my career in the global financial crisis, so that was great. Uh, but I spent a lot of my time looking at uh, what happened to the banks after the GFC and how their mindsets around risk, compliance, and everything started to change. And as a result of that, there was a massive, massive offboarding drive uh, in, I'd say, from about 2013, 14, 15. So many accounts were cut off, and these were considered kale accounts. Now, if you look at, you know, moving forward several years later, many of these tail clients have grown on to become unicorns, uh, massive hedge funds that were ignored or had their backs turned on them by their traditional providers. And I know a few of these players who say we would never go back to that bank that didn't provide us with the services at the time because they cut us off and it caused a lot of damage in that relationship. This for me, if I draw a parallel, is exactly the same kind of area that the VBs are looking to plug into, particularly with respect to that area of the market that isn't touched by the traditional incumbents, that they can open a door for something a bit more unique. And many of these companies are the new growth prospects going forward. If I look at many, many of the SMEs that won't be serviced by the incumbents, it's a real shame because they're leaving a lot of future business on the table. Forget about the current wallet. It's significantly larger down the road. Yes, absolutely, Ben. Great point there. Now, the first question from the audience, I think it's really for both CEOs because it's, you know, we're talking about the sweet spot you know, how SME could be a sweet spot. So what might be the sweet spot within that sweet spot? Is it a sizable clientele base or is it rampant diversification of products and services to enhance the stickiness of the clients with you? Roxanne? Yeah, let me, let me try that out. Um, sweet spot, I think it's actually just a new way of thinking of banking. And as you said, ZA Bank is a hybrid of retail and commercial banking. But actually, that's like a, a, a minimum requirement. I think in Hong Kong, at least, any banking can't survive with simply just one-sided. Um, and from, from, from my point of view, we're promoting corporate banking because if you look at corporate clients, the key need is financing. And then so retail provided the funding um, corporate gave me the loan. So it goes hand in hand and definitely um, that's a sweet spot because SME 
uh, lending still have a higher margin. Of course, high risk, high return comes with a higher credit loss, but if we can mitigate the higher credit loss and give a much better preferential rate to our SME clients, I think that's a win-win situation. So I think sweet spot, I wouldn't say, but it's, it's, it's actually a, a viable a requirement to have a successful banking model and a sustainable um, performance. Thank you, Rockton. How about Ryan from, from PAOB's perspectives? Well, the, I, I think for PAOB, the way that we see the Swiss spot is really about um, availability of data. Because the data will enable us to serve the SME in a quite different way. And uh, also enable us to um, monitor or service the account in the most efficient manner. And this for us is important. Um, I think maybe there's another Swiss box that we can talk about this. Given the fact that data is so important, given the fact that we just talk about commercial data interchange, I think the credit should also go to key, play, key market participants like um, FTA, because this sort of seminar, the more this, this sort of seminar or communication that we have, the easier for the banks to let the potential client, i.e. the micro SME to understand how important it is to them to over consent, because data doesn't mean that we should circumvent some of the control. It's really about how to en enable the data owner to appreciate the benefits after sharing or uh, increasing the willingness to share the data with the banks. Bank is not e devil evil. The reason why bank wants all those data is to enable them to serve them in a better way. Because without data, we'll go back to the traditional way. We will go back to the paper base, extremely high cost, extremely inefficient. But with data, we can, it seems that at least based on the experience that we have had so far, it address those points or those pain, those pain points. So the, I believe the Swiss box of the Swiss box is really about how we can work jointly to educate the market, to let the data owner appreciate the benefits to themselves that um, after offering consent, what are the additional services that they can get from the bank? And uh, somehow, I think I also agree with uh, Roxanne. Um, for, for the banks, I don't perceive virtual bank is a competition to the traditional player. We are not in a zero sum game. We are now talking about, we're finding a different way, an alternative way to serve those clients that are not being served by the traditional players. So we yeah, have indeed serving a different salmon. Of course, that would be a small portion of overlapping, but it should, it should not be the biggest part, at least based on the actual experience that we have observed in the past nine months or so. Majority are, in fact, the client not being served by the bank. So i.e. we are not in a zero sum game. And more important, the beauty of having the virtual bank or this sort of a Swiss box, if we can make this happen or if we can serve them well, first of all, it benefits the whole Hong Kong economy because I'm sure everyone will agree that SME is a big part of or important part of the economies anyway. So, but there were a lot of SME who cannot survive or who cannot make a success because they don't have access of credit or bank services. But now with virtual bank with a different way of serve, of surfing model, they're being able to serve, i.e. they send a higher chance to survive. They also send a, send a high chance to make contribution to the society as well. So that's one part. The um, second part is imagine, I think deposit and lending is just the basic part because I, I, I'm now serving the trade SMEs. And obviously the trade SME will also need to have some ethics support, some cross border bank services support as well. Now being able to bank with a bank, they get access to all these things in a much more effic efficient manner than yeah. where they are or where they were in the past. So that's how I see the Swiss box of the Swiss box. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Now, um, the, the next question really is uh, more for CA. Uh, so, uh, Roxanne, how does that relationship manager, you know, having an RM and mm -hmm. kind of in-person process uh, dovetail uh, and fit into the SME offering for, for ZA? Uh, RM is still the key customer interactive point for our commercial banking, because as I said, the, the process and the business nature is completely different from retail, whereby you can just do a back app. So I think from, from the uh, official channel, if you go into our website, um, bank.ca.group, there is actually an account opening application webpage, whereby you put in all your information and we'll contact you accordingly. And I think the customer service hotline, I think that one of the questions that 
those guys never call back. I think that's the uh, first apologize for that bad customer experience because one of our objectives give you a very good customer experience. But then also I think if you, ha if you haven't completed the account opening application process, please do so. Uh, if not, just call up customer service again and quote my name. I'm sure, I'm sure they would come back to you with a right appropriate RM. So hopefully that would resolve precious talents problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it, it, the same question was asked of PAOB as well. How do you find the relationship manager? Um, but I think there's a quick answer for that, right, Ryan? Well, um, I think for us, relationship manager, we also have a big team of our relationship manager, but the whole purpose is to support our client to open an account because um, we have a specific use case and support by the specific data. And that's why for our trade client who want to open an account, all they need to do is to download our app. They can complete the whole process in about 25 uh, to 40 minutes. Depends on the corporate structure and the number of director. Um, and the whole account can be in operation in about one day, one business day on average based on the past uh, information that we observe. And again, because of all these, uh, we, let, we can leverage on the trading data. They do not have to supply any paper document, be it financial statement or bank statement uh, for, for account opening. So the, then people may ask, uh, why we still have a team of relationship manager? That is simple because I think uh, as Roxanne already mentioned, to open an account for SME is quite different from opening an account for individual. And we find that the owner of, a, of an enterprise has always find it difficult to set up the uh, delegation or authority of various user of the company. Because of under what circumstances should be a single sign, under what circumstances should be joint approval. All these things will create anxiety or uncertainty for the business owner. And that's why we, as part of the customer services, we decided to set up a team of relationship managers so that uh, we can talk to the customer, be face-to-face -face or through video call um, in order to address some of the concerns that they may have. Because we understand all this is a journey. Just like three, four years ago, when people opened their account for mobile, there was a short period of anxiety, a short period of, um, they, well, I think put it this way, the people will have to step out of the comfort zone to, start, to try something new. And for us, we understand it involves a bit of interaction between the yeah. bank and, and the client. And that's why we set up a RM team. And that's uh, exactly the whole purpose or reasons why we still adopt a kind of like a um, hybrid approach. We have the mobile to basically serve the whole things, but we still have RM to support our client. Great, thank you very much, Ryan. Now I got, you know, please uh, for the audience, feel free to raise questions again through the Q and A app. We'll try to get to to that as soon as possible. But there is one burning question that I really want to, you know, pick on the brains of everyone here, and that burning question. Uh, has to do with the overbank situation in Hong Kong and the fact that we only got about 7 million uh, people in, in terms of the population. So certainly you must be looking at the GBA, the Greater Bay Area or something in terms of expanding the horizons of that. Because unlike in Europe, um, you know, the, the, the you know, critical mass uh, may not really be there uh, in terms of you know the Hong Kong population. So how does GBA come into play in your growth plans? Maybe I'll go back to Ben first because uh, you know there were actually points in the report that touches on that uh, before we you know go into the straight talk with the CEOs. If that's okay. Hi Ben. My apologies. Uh, yeah, well, GBA opens up a, a very interesting space. I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of the people on this call would know GBA, uh, know what GBA is, Greater Bay Area. But when you're looking at the diaspora of the cities that fall within the GBA, uh, it's basically a catchment area of 70 plus million people, which is effectively opening up a market that is 10x Hong Kong, just in terms of population size alone. And obviously the dynamics within an area, new startup company, Shenzhen being a massive tech hub, uh, it does open up a lot of opportunity for banking providers to step in and really plug a gap or look to offer that, uh, look to offer their services. But I think despite the opportunity opening up, you're seeing a lot of the, the GBA narrative being built around outside of the, v, the VB's Connect scheme. So Stock Connect, Bond Connect, Wealth Connect. Um, all of these are trying to find what I would call uh, some kind of alignment between two, two jurisdictions, which 
fundamentally operate a different set of legal and compliance parameters. So working out how to, I guess, capture the GBA story from an offshore footprint, there is only, in my view, there's only so much that the virtual banks can do. Uh, a big part of it is out of control and it's trying to work out, will the regulators provide a bit more convergence around those areas, open up the opportunities. For example, even in retail, you can only set up an account in a virtual bank if you are a Hong Kong resident, right? So you can't really tap into the GBA population right now. The same kind of logic can be applied to Hong Kong residents that have an SME here. So you are serviced as a local account, but you know, the big, that's the big story, right? That's the big, I would say, call it the golden goose. And if that opportunity to get, can open up, particularly for the VBs who are set up here, given the connectivity with the parent companies in China, uh, that's a big game changer in my view. That's uh, something fairly substantial. Ryan and Roxanne, I don't know if you have additional thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm with you because um, I think for GP8, um, I think what can that everyone talk about then um, I personally, I, I'm not sure the, um, whether virtual bank can really benefit from this particular area or not. But um, perhaps our key focus is really on the SMEs. Um, one of the policies um, already announced by um, the regulators in the region, which is about um, in, in the GP8, um, somehow the banks in Hong Kong are also encouraged to extend non RMB lending to the SMGs in the GBA area. And this certainly will open up the eyesight and the potential for not just virtual bank, but everyone in the town. Because we all understand um, the foreign currency, the, the cost of funds in Hong, the, for the banks in Hong Kong is certainly lower than that of the banks in uh, China. And if we can somehow come up with a process that enables us to effect this lending process in an efficient manner, that from the whole region and point of view, it makes the SME in the GBA region more competitive because now they're able to lower the cost of fund. And secondly, it also opened up another big business, big business potential for the banks in Hong Kong to compete with as well. So the, that's why the, I believe for GBA certainly to address Helen's question, um, GBA is certainly one of the key areas um, that we focus, but I think this concern is not just for the virtual bank, but all players, all players in Hong Kong. The most important is throughout the process how we can identify some unique value proposition. How can we how can we create some unique value for the SMEs? How can we contribute to the development of the region? Absolutely agree on that, Ryan. Uh, Roxanne, please, can we have your you know valuable perspectives on this one as well? Thanks. Well, I think riding on, on Ryan's comment, I think GPA is both opportunity for, for retail and also wholesale banking. But then taking a step back, and we have to be ready before going to this market because we do have very strong competitors in that area. So it's not just like opportunities we see from the Hong Kong banking perspective, but also who we are facing. And if we're looking at technology um, advancement, I think China, mainland China does have an advantage over us. And that's why we are catching up in a way. So my next step, um, of course, observing the policies and regulations, yes. But then I think we'll do our homework first. We have to prove that virtual banking in Hong Kong is a sustainable and successful model. Then we go into GBA. Um, I mean, whatever policies that pops up, I mean, definitely we have to follow. But then we have to also prove ourselves to both regulators such that we are allowed to operate in the Greater Bay Area. So that's my two cents. Great, great. That's much more than two cents, Roxanne. That's like $20 plus plus. <laughs> okay, so we, we actually got three questions from the audience, which are relatively straightforward. Um, so, you know, uh, let's take it in the order in which they come in. Um, how relevant will be the offer of services, you know, with partners, you know, with some of your, you know, uh, business partners into your strategy in serving uh, the SMEs? Uh, maybe Roxanne, can I turn to you first? I think, I think partnership is one of the uh, angles that, that all virtual banks are applying because we want to move fast and faster, the better. So, so we are engaging with partners, um, offering different services. And I think for CA Bank, our partnership is under ZMD Club. So we do partner with other vendors such that other than financial services, we do uh, fund, fund those, um, all the services that our corporate clients need, just like retail banking. We, 
we partner with McDonald's, Deliveroo, da da da. So so the same angle because we do believe partnership with, is a strong um, driver for growth, as far as providing good services and building customer trust. So absolutely. yes, partnership is key. Yeah, absolutely. It's building out their ecosystem as well, right? Yeah. So Ryan, can we have your thoughts on this one, please? Well, no, I I think I'm totally with um, Roxanne's because um, well, I, I think partnership for POB. What you can see easily is a really trailing, for example, they are our partner to provide the data that enable us to build our own risk model that enable us to serve the trade SMEs differently. And more important, um, the trailing also help us on client acquisition because these are the client. They have, con they have all the contact with the client. So that by, by doing so, we are able to control acquisition costs much lower compared with the traditional acquisition campaign. And as a result, because um, it, our, our thought process is simple. Whenever we have benefit, we share with our client. And that's somehow that uh, people can evidence through the pricing because we partner with Hong Kong MC and we offer 90% SME finance guarantee scheme. Somehow this largely control the risk exposure or protect us from the risk exposure. And as a result, we can share the benefit of our SME client by lowering the interest rate and put a cap on interest rate. Same case, our acquisition course through the partnership with trailing, we're able to over in a much more effective manner. And somehow that gives us a much lower cost base. And And we can control, uh, we, we can return or, or servicing from. <clears throat> Another way to look at it is, um, as Roxanne mentioned, we also in the process to build different partnerships because we all understand SME will have different needs. Opening an account and having credit facility is just part of the need, not all the needs. So, but as virtual man, we don't have to reinvent the view for every particular services. Mm -hmm. The key is really about how we connect with the right partner so that we can over probably one of the most efficient services to us as SMEs, and as they develop, we're able to grow with the SMEs to make sure that the services being provided by the platform that we have had would be able to support the development plan. Great, great, great. Uh, ben, any thoughts to add to that before we go to the other questions? No, I'll leave it with the, uh, the, the CEOs. This is really <laughs> the areas I think they should be contributing and sharing their views. Cool. Now, the next question is really for both CEOs, because, uh, you know, in case of default payment by the borrowers, how do you well balance between the debt collection and maintaining that customer relationship? Roxen? Sure. I think, I think it's the, the question or the answer should be the flip side, right? If a client wants to default on a bank, what are they thinking about the banking relationship? But I think from a banking point of view, of course, we will, it really is a very subjective situation. Every default has a, has a story behind. And of course, we want to maintain the business relationship as in make sure the client can survive. So if the client is truthfully defaulting because they cannot survive, of course, there's no relationship to talk about. So that's a pretty simple, simple situation from my point of view. I mean, customer relationship is key, but then if the customer wants to default on you, that's a trigger point. They, they want to throw up the relationship. So we'll see how we can help them. If not, we'll just call them default. Okay, thank you. Ryan, and is there a different way to treat it? <laughs> yes, Ryan. Well, the, I, I think my thought process is similar because our key client that we want to serve is uh, SMEs. So in the case of default, I think to us, perhaps the very first step is really to talk with the client to understand what caused them in such a situation, what we can help. I think Hong Kong MA has demonstrated a very good example in the market, which is to encourage the bank to offer some briefing space for the SMEs. Whenever they need to, um, to, to ask for an interest payment only period, the bank should support. That will be a good gesture to show that the bank should always support the SMEs. They may have, um, they may have some overdue payment record from time to time, but if bank can help them to restructure, there's a good way that can um, make it higher chance to survive. So that's how we see it. Of course, just in case if the owner of the SME decides that to close it down, of course, that, uh, then that would be very sad. I mean, don't have other choice but to uh, process the recovery process. But that's not the first option that we should have. The very first option for us is really about 
talk with SME, understand what caused them in such a sticky situation, and also to discuss with them, would there be any way that we can structure the account that make them can go through this difficult moment? There's some, because we are dealing with SME, helping them to get through the difficult situation is the far most important consideration for us. Thank you. And another quick question. Uh, can corporate set up an escrow account with, with, uh, with the BB? One thing I will... Yeah. Sorry. Hi, Ben. I think we lost. Hi, Ben, you're breaking up. Uh, yeah, we can't hear Ben. He was trying to say something. Oh, sorry. I think there's a delay in the connection. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, apologies. I think there is a significant delay in the internet. So let me just try and work this out. I will not pause. I will assume that there is a delay. So I'll just continue on. The only thing that I really wanted to add with the collections business is that you enter an area where it becomes uh, a bit more of an ethical discussion. This has actually been uh, something where the technology behind collections has exploded and matured quite considerably in the past few years. Uh, if you look in particular, there's a solution called Flow. It was formerly Asia, uh, Asia Collect in Southeast Asia. And as a result of that, creating a lot of what I would call personalized, automated and movement towards what I would consider ethical debt collection. Now, I don't think Hong Kong suffers from the same ethical uh, debt collection dilemma as you would see in some more frontier or emerging markets. Um, the system is not necessarily, you know, visit someone's place on a scooter with a baseball bat. Uh, but notwithstanding that, the reality is you are seeing many of these tools being deployed, which uh, does SMS automation, predictive dialing, speech analytics to determine stress or tones in voice. Many of these things do help to develop a better understanding of a customer and to really get at the heart of is this a problem to go back to what Ryan and Roxon said, where they can help, right? As opposed to something where an SME has just fundamentally said, I just don't want to pay the loan, right? They're two very different things. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you for adding that in. I think that's quite uh, you know, insightful. So quick question, really. Uh, can a corporate set up an escrow uh, account with the banks? Uh, Roxon? Well, at my bank, not yet, but then definitely if there's a customer need, we'll think through it. Okay, how about at Ping and One Connect? Um, I think the same answer at the moment, we cannot. Um, again, I, I think for us, um, uh, the way that we plan to expand our business is really about um, based on the client that we, we, we can serve in a different way, i.e. based on the area that we can identify a business partner. Um, Escrow account, to some extent, escrow account is a traditional banking services or product that, um, that require a different set of um, platform or skill set to serve. Um, I think for us, the key focus at this stage is really about um, how we can serve those time and not being served by the traditional player, uh, how we can address some of the pain point or deficiency pain problem that we have, uh, we have identified. So escrow account in short, um, is beyond our scope at the moment. Okay, thank you for that. Another quick one, how can VBs manage their market risk, like, you know, FX risk, interest risk, et cetera? Is that like a treasury uh, function behind it? Is it digitized treasury function? Well, uh, let me clarify. A, a virtual bank is a full licensed bank, so we have all the functions required. And, and treasury is the one function that we do need uh, whether you're a traditional bank or virtual bank. And we do manage all the market risks in terms of FX, interest rate risk, the same as a traditional bank. Uh, it may automatic, automatic treasury function. Uh, nope, it's, it's not that automatic. It's still a, a, a human-driven risk-based uh, risk approach. But we do have all those risks, so we just manage them properly. Yeah, it's so important to remember that a VB license is a full banking license, except without the brick and mortars, uh, yep. you know, uh, branches. That that's the only difference. Ryan, anything to add to that? Well, the, if I may, I think probably the, the only point that I will add is um, perhaps from regulated point of view, um, the the expectation uh, in respect of uh, cybersecurity on the virtual banks is could be even higher than some of the traditional players. 
I think uh, we can understand this because um, for Virtual Bank, we don't have the branch network, i.e. that will always be concerned about um, single point of failure. And that's why um, all yeah. the Virtual Banks, um, I think all, 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 all the friends in the Virtual Banks, we are indeed subject to an even higher uh, requirement or scrutiny from yeah. Hong Kong MA as to how our, our system, our platform should be set up so as to achieve um, the advanced level of uh, the CRAF standard, which is a, a framework created by Hong Kong MA for the banks to measure uh, or, or to assess uh, from cyber security point of view. Yeah, thank you. Now, one quick question before I go to my final point that I really want to, you know, uh, pick your brains on. The, the final quick question is really from the audience about do you still need to go to the office of PAOB to open the account? Well, um, I think as I mentioned before, um, normally there are two choices to open an account. Of course, we can have RM to support, but there's another possibility, which is there's another alternative, which is to use video. Um, yeah. I think going back, going to POB office is one part, but we also have RM to visit our clients. Uh, so that's why I, don't, I think visiting POB office certainly is not a must because uh, we have a team of relationship managers and the whole purpose is really about to improve or to enhance the surface experience, make sure that we are here to serve because we're in a banking industry and banking, the whole purpose is to provide service to our client. Thank you so much. So great, some great questions from the audience, really. Uh, I, you know, as we are wrapping up, I really want to leave the audience with some, you know, words of wisdom uh, and kind of forward looking uh, kind of, you know, vision uh, from the CEOs and from Ben, our chairman. So uh, fast forward, say three years from now, okay? What does success look like for you, for your banks? Fast forward three years. Well, fast forward four years. I'll break even. Okay. I think that's a benchmark. Okay. Okay. That's that that that's great. That's great. Because maintain this. That's what I said. Sustainable business model means first we don't need um, to have losses because I mean it's the first time I work at a bank that has been making losses. So that I want to weed it out. Um. Secondly, I think capital adequacy is one of the key measurements for banks' prudence. And to make sure you have sufficient capital adequacy, I mean, your, your PL has to be positive. And then your growth will be supported by additional capital injection plus your retain earnings. So that's why I say break even is a key thing for me for the next three to four years. Great. Ryan? Well, the, I, I think for us, certainly um, make ourselves to be profitable is uh, one of the key objectives because we are not in a charity business and we all understand if a bank cannot be a profitable one, the outcome will not be a fruitful one as well. Um, but if I may, there's also two other objectives that I want to achieve. The second one is really about how we create a different experience. I think um, for our trailing business model is just the first example. I, I really want to make more examples so that we can demonstrate to the market, we can demonstrate to all the target customer that they can be served differently. They can be served with a much more efficient process at a much lower cost compared with where they are today. The thirdly is um, as the new player or new participant, where possible, we would also like to make some contribution to the existing industry as well. And, and that's why as a Ping Almond Connect Bank, uh, we are always happy to talk with other competition or other participants as to how we can make the best use of the platform that we have Built, and that's why the when we we are we have been uh, actively participating in the CDI platform, because we have the view that the, the risk model that we have developed, um, if other players also happen to to find it to be variable, we're happy to export, because that would be the best way to promote the banking services in Hong Kong and also to get the whole industry in the way and advance further. Great, great. And any thoughts on fast forward three, four years, you know? Uh, ben, you're on mute. Yeah, absolutely, I do. I mean, you can see in the report what our view is around what that looks like, but a couple of things that I really want to focus on for this. If the underserved segment can be meaningfully plugged, then you will know that the proposition that many of the VBs set out to tackle 
is uh, being well done. And I think from Ryan's perspective, right, it isn't a zero sum game. So, you know, if, if that area that is getting rejected for loans or not receiving them, that's being ignored by the market is being meaningfully addressed from a, a share of customers uh, on the VB platforms, then I think that's one big tick. I actually would go even further to what Ryan says and challenge the fact that it's not a zero sum, because I would say, if you're starting to see the VBs attract some of the SMEs and retail and everything away from the traditional brick and mortar, such that they end up being considered the first bank of choice or the first bank to be opened up, then I think you're onto something. That's where it's no longer the VBs or a secondary account. I can get some higher interest rates here or they can service something. It's really, I don't need to have an HSBC default account there at all. I don't need a standard chartered account the VBs can do all of this for me. And then I think the final thing, the third one, is if they can prove that they use data in the right way through the KPIs and metrics. So you're targeting an underserviced segment, show me that the NPLs are running at or equal or less than the competitors. And then you're proving that the power of the information that you have and the data you have far surpasses that of the traditional brick and mortars. Show me that the fee-based income on top of the relative lending book as a proportion is even greater because then you're cross-selling even better and customers demanding many more products outside of what is an interest-based model. If these kinds of things are developing in years to come, I think the VBs will show hands down beyond the move to profitability that the business model or the principles of what underlies the business model works. Uh, and that is a very exciting thing for me to see personally. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for chiming in on that. And on that note, I think we have come to an end of today's session. I want to thank uh, of the two CEOs, Ryan and Roxanne, uh, for taking their time, you know, very valuable insights, and of course, for supporting the research report from day one and offering all the input. Uh, and it's really vibrant to see, you know, how the landscape in, in VB um, develops. Uh, so, you know, very happy to be moderating this session. Thank you again. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Roxanne. And Thank you can you. catch this uh, on our on, on the FinTech Association's uh, channels and, and websites, uh, you know, in, in case people that might want to refer back uh, to this conversation. And we have another one coming up in about a week's time uh, for uh, those that specifically focus on the retail uh, uh, sectors. So, you know, again, stay tuned. Uh, you know, and we'll be talking again very soon. Thank you again, and have a good day. Great. Thanks, Thank everyone. Ryan. Thanks, Ryan, Roxanne, and Helene. Appreciate it.